To encode you on roll. To decode you on roll. StatQuest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StatQuest. Today we're going to talk about Seek to Seek and encoder decoder neural networks, and they're going to be clearly explained. Lightning AI, it's the easiest way to scale your work up in the cloud, Lightning. This stack quest is also brought to you by the letters A, B, and C. A, always. B, B. C, curious. Always be curious. Note. This stack quest assumes that you are already familiar with long, short-term memory neural networks and word embedding. If not, check out the quests. Also, I want to give a special triple bam thanks to Ben Trevitt. His awesome tutorials on GitHub, the links are in the description below, made it possible for me to create this quest. Hey look, it's Statsquatch and the Normalsaurus. Hey Josh, I want to tell my friend in Spain, let's go but I don't know Spanish. Can you help? Sure thing, Squatch. I've got a sequence of amino acids that I want translated into 3D structures like alpha helices. What? I've got a sequence of amino acid that I want translated. Don't worry, Norm. I can help. Both of you have sequences of one type of thing that need to be translated into sequences of another type of thing. Both of these problems, and many others, are called sequence-to-sequence, -sequence or seek-to-seek, -seek problems. One way to solve seek-to-seek -seek problems is with something called an encoder-decoder model, which we'll talk about in this stack quest. BAM! Note, the basic seek-to-seek encoder-decoder models that we're going to talk about today are totally awesome but they are also a stepping stone to learning about transformers, which we'll talk about in future stack quests. In other words, today we're taking another step in our quest to understand transformers, which form the basis of big fancy large language models like ChatGPT. Anyway, to illustrate how to solve a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem using a seek-to-seek encoder-decoder model, let's create one that translates English sentences into Spanish. Specifically, Squatch wants to tell his Spanish friend, let's go, so we'll create an encoder-decoder model that can do this. First, however, let's talk a little bit more about the problem we want to solve. The first thing, which is pretty obvious, is that not all sentences in the English language are the same length. For example, someone might say, let's go, or they might say, my name is Statsquatch. So we need something that can take different length sentences as input. Likewise, not all Spanish sentences are the same length, so we need something that can generate different length sentences as output. Lastly, the Spanish translation of an English sentence can have a different length than the original. For example, the two-word English sentence, let's go, translates to the one-word Spanish sentence, vamos. So we need our seek-to-seek encoder-decoder model to be able to handle variable input and variable output lengths. The good news is that we already know how to use long, short-term memory units to deal with variable length inputs and outputs. For example, if the input sentence is let's go, then we put let's into the input for the LSTM, and then unroll the LSTM, and then plug go into the second input. However, we're getting ahead of ourselves. If you remember from the word embedding stack quest, we can't just jam words into a neural network. Instead, we use an embedding layer to convert the words into numbers. Note, to keep the example relatively simple, the English vocabulary for our encoder decoder only has three words, let's, to, and go, and this symbol, EOS, which stands for End of Sentence. Oh no, it's the dreaded terminology alert! Because the vocabulary contains a mix of words and symbols, we refer to the individual elements in the vocabulary as tokens. Also note, in this example, we're just creating two embedding values per token instead of hundreds or thousands. Okay. 
Now that we have an embedding layer for our input vocabulary, we can put it in front of the input for the LSTM. Now, when we have the input sentence, let's go, we put a 1 in the input for let's and a 0 for everything else. And then we unroll the LSTM and the embedding layer and put a 1 in the input for go and a 0 for everything else. Note, to be clear, when we unroll the LSTM and the embedding layer, we reuse the exact same weights and biases no matter how many times we unroll them. In other words, the weights and biases in the LSTM cell and embedding layer that we use for the word let's are the exact same weights and biases that we use for the word go. Now, in theory, this is all we need to do to encode the input sentence let's go. Bam. However, in practice, in order to have more weights and biases to fit the model to our data, people often add additional LSTM cells to the input. To keep things simple, we'll just add one additional LSTM cell to this stage. This means that the two embedding values for the word let's are used as the input values for two different LSTM cells. And these two LSTM cells have their own, separate, sets of weights and biases. And when we unroll them for the word go, the original LSTM cell reuses its set of weights and biases, and the new LSTM cell reuses its separate set of weights and biases. Now, to add even more weights and biases to fit the model to our data, people often add additional layers of LSTMs. To illustrate how this works, we'll add one more LSTM layer to the encoder. What that means is that the output values, the short-term memories, or the hidden states, from the unrolled LSTM units in the first layer, are used as the inputs to the unrolled LSTM units in the second layer. Note, just like how both embedding values are used as inputs to both LSTM cells in the first layer, both outputs, the short-term memories, or hidden states, from each cell in the first layer are used as inputs to both LSTM cells in the second layer. Lastly, the only thing left to do is to initialize the long and short-term memories, the cell and hidden states. And now we're done creating the encoder part of the encoder-decoder model. In this example, we have two layers of LSTMs, with two LSTM cells per layer. In essence, the encoder encodes the input sentence, let's go, into a collection of long and short-term memories, also known as cell and hidden states. BAM! Oh no, it's the dreaded terminology alert, again! The last long and short-term memories, the cell and hidden states, from both layers of the LSTM cells in the encoder are called the context vector. Thus, the encoder encodes the input sentence, let's go, into the context vector. Now we need to decode the context vector. So, the first thing we do is connect the long and short-term memories, the cell and hidden states, that form the context vector to a new set of LSTMs. That, just like the encoder, have two layers, and each layer has two cells. Note, to be clear, the LSTMs in the decoder are different from the ones in the encoder and have their own separate weights and biases. Anyway, the context vector is used to initialize the long and short-term memories, the cell and hidden states, in the LSTMs in the decoder. And the ultimate goal of the decoder is to decode the context vector into the output sentence. So, just like in the encoder, the input to the LSTM cells in the first layer comes from an embedding layer. However, now the embedding layer creates embedding values for the Spanish words ear, vamos, and e, and the eos, end of sentence, symbol. In other words, this is the embedding layer that we use in the encoder, and this is the embedding layer that we use in the decoder. As you can see, they have different input words and symbols, or tokens, and different weights, which result in different embedding values for each token. Now, because we just finished encoding the English sentence, let's go, 
the decoder starts with the embedding values for the EOS end of sentence token. In this case, we're using the EOS token to start the decoding because that is what they used in the original manuscript. However, sometimes you'll see people use SOS for start of sentence. Anyway, the decoder does the math with the two layers of LSTMs, each with two LSTM cells. And the output values from the top layer of LSTM cells are transformed by additional weights and biases in what is called a fully connected layer. A fully connected layer is just another name for a basic vanilla neural network. This fully connected layer has two inputs for the two values that come from the LSTM cells in the top layer and four outputs, one for each token in the Spanish vocabulary. And, in between, we have connections between each input and output with weights and biases. Then we run the output of the fully connected layer through a softmax function to pick out the output word. Now, going back to the full encoder-decoder model, we see that the output from the softmax function is vamos, the Spanish translation for let's go. Double bam? Not yet. So far, the translation is correct, but the decoder doesn't stop until it outputs an EOS token. So we plug the word vamos into the decoder's unrolled embedding layer and unroll the two LSTM cells in each layer and then run the output values into the same fully connected layer. And the next predicted token is EOS. And that means we translated the English sentence, let's go, into the correct Spanish sentence. Vamos. Double bam. To summarize the decoder stage, the context vector, created by both layers of the encoder's unrolled LSTM cells, are used to initialize the LSTMs in the decoder. And the input to the LSTMs comes from the output word embedding layer that starts with EOS, but subsequently uses whatever word was predicted by the output layer. In practice, the decoder will keep predicting words until it predicts the EOS token or it hits some maximum output length. Note, by decoupling the encoder from the decoder, the input text and the translated output text can be different lengths. In this case, we translated the two-word English sentence, let's go, to a one-word Spanish sentence, vamos. Bam. Note, just like for all neural networks, all of these weights and biases are trained using backpropagation. And if you're not already familiar with backpropagation, check out the quests. That said, encoder-decoder models have two special things that happen during training. In this example, we use the predicted token, vamos, as the input to the unrolled LSTMs. In contrast, when training an encoder-decoder, instead of using the predicted token as input to the decoder LSTMs, we use the known correct token. In other words, if the first predicted token was the Spanish word E, which translates to and in English, and thus is the wrong word, then during training, we'll still use vamos, the correct Spanish word, as input to the unrolled LSTMs. Also, during training, instead of just predicting tokens until the decoder predicts the EOS token, each output phrase ends where the known phrase ends. In other words, even if the second predicted token was the Spanish word ear instead of the correct token, EOS, then, during training, we'll still stop predicting additional tokens. Plugging in the known words and stopping at the known phrase length rather than using the predicted tokens for everything is called teacher forcing which sounds vaguely like what happened when I took Introduction to Statistics in school. Lastly, let's talk about the differences between this super simple encoder-decoder model and the model used in the original sequence-to-sequence -sequence manuscript. 
first, instead of just using three words and one symbol, or a total of four tokens in each input and output vocabulary, the original manuscript had an input vocabulary with 160,000 tokens, and an output vocabulary with 80,000 tokens. Also, instead of just two embedding values per token, the original manuscript created 1,000. And instead of two layers of LSTMs with two LSTM cells in each layer, the original manuscript used four layers with 1,000 LSTM cells per layer. Also, the output layer had 1,000 inputs from the 1,000 LSTM cells in the fourth layer, and 80,000 outputs to match the size of the output vocabulary. Lastly, my simple model, which I coded in PyTorch Lightning, only has 220 weights and biases to train. But the model in the original manuscript had 384 million weights and biases to train. And that gives you a sense of the scale that these models can have. Triple BAM! Now it's time for some... Shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest PDF study guides and my book, The StatQuest Illustrated Guide to Machine Learning, at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs or a t-shirt or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!